Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Eritrean Youth Solidarity for Change for making this event possible. My special gratitude, though, goes to Professor Dan Connell uh, for being with us here out of his busy schedule. Uh, welcome, Professor Dan Connell. I'm really honored to introduce you with one of the most renowned scholars on Eritrean studies. Uh, I must mention that Professor Dan Connell's academic contribution on assorted aspects of Eritrean studies, uh, especially in relation to the country's liberation struggle from the mid-1970s to 1990s, and its post-independence period or its post-independence development is really uh, immeasurable. I must also say that uh, Professor Dan Connell has been one of the few Western scholars of Africa, such as Basil Davidson, who strived to offer a pragmatic picture of Eritrea's history during the liberation struggle and the country's political experience and developments uh, during the post-independence period. As did majority Eritreans, you know, uh, Dan Connell hoped for a smooth democratic transformation of the country from devastating liberation struggle to a democratic state in which fundamental human rights would be uh, respected. Dan Connell's experience uh, with Eritrea studies, you know, can be traced back to the mid-1970s. As a young and passionate journalist and writer, you know, he took a grave risk to travel to the most troubled war zone in Eritrea. He entered Ethiopian strongholds. He took the risk, you know, to inquire points of view from the side of the liberation struggle. In 1993, uh, Diane Connell published his first chronicle about the Eritrean revolution uh, that's called Against All Odds. While working on this chronicle, Diane Connell continued his research and engagement in Eritrea and attempted many other publications related to developments in Eritrea. Uh, moreover, uh, Dan Connell started to become engaged in conducting research in the neighboring countries of Sudan, uh, during which he visited uh, rebel-held areas and debriefed defectors from Sudan's armed forces and from Osama bin Laden's emerging terrorist network. Uh, through his experience in Eritrea, Dan Connell published a number of books as well as many, many academic articles in journals. A uh, few among the list of his against all odds, taking on the superpowers, building a new nation, uh, conversations with Eritrean political prisoners. In 2001, while conducting research in Eritrea, he demonstrated his concerns and became critic about the growing violation of fundamental human rights in Eritrea, as well as the slowing down of the process of democratization in the country. He, as many other Western activists, was then banished by the Eritrean government uh, since the time when Dan Connell was uh, discharged from Eritrea he has held the position of senior lecturer in journalism and African studies at Simmons College in Boston. Uh, during this period he has written extensively on Eritrea's transition into despotism and the new country's political behavior in the Horn of Africa. We are really, really honored to have him here. Please put your hand together and join me in welcoming him. Welcome, Professor Duncan. Quite some years, but when I was uh, a good deal younger, 
I attended graduate school at the University of Buffalo. And Toronto was a city we all enjoyed uh, coming up to uh, at that time. The time that I was uh, in university was the uh, height of the Vietnam War. And we were busy protesting that uh, and being uh, threatened with uh, being beaten up uh, and worse in Buffalo, uh, where many people there took those who were protesting against the war as anti-American. We weren't Amer anti-American. We felt, in fact, very pro-American. Uh, we just felt that uh, the country's values were being uh, trampled and our policies were being taken in a wrong direction. And I say that because we are here facing the same kinds of issues on our trip. Over the past decade, since uh, I was last permitted inside, uh, it's occurred thousands of Eritreans have fled the country, trying to seek sanctuary first in neighboring Ethiopia or Sudan, often at great personal <laughs> risk. But for most who get that far, the challenge is only beginning. The difficulties in those camps have been uh, considerable uh, and, and have gotten in the case of Sudan, far worse uh, in recent years with the added threats of kidnapping uh, and so on. Uh, the efforts to get out uh, and traveling across North Africa or through the Middle East uh, or, or South to South Africa, uh, as some have, uh, and some of you may have as well, coming across to South America and up uh, uh, through Central America and Mexico. The situation 20 years ago was reversed. Arab trains were coming back to the country from all over the world, coming back to try to make a contribution to reconstructing the war on ground devastated land uh, and to build a, a new nation. This was, uh, of course, I don't need to tell anyone here because I think everyone here is uh, deeply familiar with the, the history, but this was uh, a time of en enormous hope for Eritrea uh, within the country and within the wider international community. Uh, this was a, 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 an independence movement that had uh, taken major strides during the war to try to transform, transform the society itself. By the close of the war, uh, as many as a third of the members of the EPLF uh, were women. Uh, ethnicity and religion had receded as major fault lines in the society, but were quickly not gone. Uh, the, uh, the front had carried out various uh, experiments with land reform, marriage reform, administrative transformation, taking a very unusual approach to the independence struggle. Unusual in that most of the liberation movements of that era, in the post-World War II era, in fact, generally postponed social change until after. But in this case, social change went hand in hand with the effort to mobilize a population. And if you've read uh, Against All Odds, you will be aware that I made the strong argument that this is one of the explanations for how a little country, one twentieth the size uh, of its foe, Ethiopia, uh, and facing an Ethiopia that had been backed by both superpowers, one after the other, uh, still succeeded in the, in, the, in the war for independence. It seemed to me uh, at that time, as I wrote it, that the keys to this involved discipline, uh, organization, uh, and also morale, uh, which in part was built on a vision of the future uh, uh, that was connected in very real ways to changes that were being promoted on the ground. Uh, just what many of the opposition movements today lack. Uh, those same strengths, of course, become uh, a very different uh, issue uh, once a war is over and a resistance movement has to make a transition uh, to a government. Uh, and I think we saw the, the signs that that transition would not be smooth right at the very beginning when the ELF and members of other organizations were not invited to come back in to participate. Eritrea's new government in the 90s started off uh, with no debt obligations because Ethiopia assumed all the financial obligations. Uh, it was largely corruption-free. It had a free hand to really start uh, reorganizing the state.
state uh, from the ground up. There was a fierce commitment to self-reliance on the part of the new state and a very uh, remarkable degree of volunteerism on the part of the population within Eritrea and outside in the diaspora uh, with people volunteering to uh, do all sorts of things to try to clean up the debris, uh, reconstruct uh, the basic infrastructure and give the, the country uh, a good start. So what happened to derail this promise and how can it be set right? I argued in uh, a number of my writings that the turning point, the key turning point, of course, was in 2000 and 2001, uh, after the last round of the border war, with uh, a war that, in fact, uh, unmasked the authoritarian tendencies inside both the movements uh, that were leading the countries in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. Uh, also, the long-standing tensions between them, which had been played down for quite a few years, but had never gone away. Uh, but above all, it revealed the, the authoritarian culture within the EPLF PFDJ, a culture that clearly had roots in the liberation movement and didn't just pop up in, in 2000. So I, I want to take a look back at this. I'm going to walk you through a short slideshow uh, of some of the images that I took uh, in the course of my visits to the field. Uh, starting in 1976, and then come back and uh, talk a little bit more about what's behind it, and finally, uh, options for our way forward. Uh, incidentally, the slides that I'm going to show, uh, past you, I'm not sure how clear that will be, because we're still uh, working with the technology here. Um, don't quite have it right, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take these and other uh, images and try to put them together in a a book that will be out, uh, at least available uh, through internet uh, connections, and you all know about it when it happens, so this is a little preview. So I'm just, I, you can 